Now, for those of you who may have been noticing, I have been using the hand sanitizer before I come up. We have a, another Nebraska company that has been helping out with hand sanitizer. This is Pacha Soap down in Hastings. And so they are now making their own antiseptic, uh, you know, hand sanitizer stuff. So we have another Nebraska company stepping up to help meet the challenge of fighting coronavirus here in our state. Well, thank you all very much for uh, joining us here this afternoon. I'm being uh, joined by Jeff Kanger with First State Bank. He's going to talk in just a few minutes with regard to the small business loans that are helping companies stay in business during this time. Paul, please come on in. You know, we start right at 2 o'clock. We're sharp here around here, okay? <laughs> He's washing. Okay, good answer. He's washing his hands, which is, leads right into what we want to remind people to do. Look, folks, stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. We are at April 8th. If you look at some of the models out there with regard to how the coronavirus is spreading in our state, we think we're gonna reach that peak here in Nebraska about the last week of April. So we really wanna make a push here for the last few days of, or for the rest of the month of April to really make sure we're all following these guidelines around stay home, stay health, stay healthy, stay connected that we want everybody to be following those social distancing guidelines. Notice that Jeff is standing very far away from me, six feet away, right? More than six feet away. The 10-person rule, don't go to any social gatherings uh, with more than 10 people. That we're washing our hands frequently with soap and water for 20 seconds at a time. That, and this is absolutely important, if you are sick with those flu-like symptoms, you've got a fever, cough, shortness of breath, you need to stay home, and everybody in your household needs to stay home. That's absolutely important to make sure we're slowing down the spread of virus here in our state. So please, everybody, continue to follow the social distancing guidelines. It's absolutely critical that you all stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. We want to make sure that we're watching out for ourselves and our health by doing things like when you go shopping, only send one person from your family, do it only once a week, only make essential trips outside your household, Stay home, but then also look out for people in your neighborhood. Look out for those uh, folks who maybe are older or who have an underlying health condition that can't go out. They may need errands run for them. They may need groceries picked up. Help out those folks too. I know a lot of churches are doing that with regard to their congregations. That may be a great way for you to be able to help somebody out and stay connected. Okay, with that, today is uh, the first, or well, this evening will be the first day of Passover. So for our Jewish friends that are celebrating Passover, and it's also a Holy Week for Christians with Easter coming on Sunday. And uh, we also, though it's not Orthodox Easter, I think it's April 19th. So, but it's the season. And as we go into this holiday, we want to remind people that, again, they should continue to follow in these guidelines. We want you to certainly worship with the solemnity of the season, but we also want you to remember, please just stay at home with your household. Just just celebrate the holiday with the people in your household. We're really trying to limit those social interactions. And also for Sunday, because we are going through a challenging time in our state. And again, our country has not seen a pandemic on this scale in over a century. What I am proclaiming is that Sunday will be a, day of, a statewide day of prayer. So as Christians are staying home on Sunday and celebrating Easter, Notice how I said staying home, right? Uh, please pray for the people who are being impacted by the coronavirus. Pre please pray for the people who are ill. Please pray for our healthcare workers, our first responders, our firefighters, our police, our EMTs, our people in our nursing homes. Please pray for all these people that have been so impacted by the coronavirus. And with that, I am going to go ahead and sign the proclamation making Sunday a statewide day of prayer. So here we go. Sunday, a statewide day of prayer. Please pray for our state on Sunday. Now, I would like to talk about another group of folks who have been working very hard, our community bankers here in Nebraska. We've got 160 banks. Uh, they've been working, coming in early in the morning, staying late until the evenings, 
to help process the applications for our businesses here in Nebraska that are applying for the Paycheck Protection Program. This is a Small Business Administration program that's been made available to get cash to businesses so they can retain their people, so that the workers there can stay on board. Those loans are forgivable. And this is something that the Treasury Department has been working on. President Trump has supported. In fact, President Trump and Secretary Mnuchin have both said they want to see more money for this program. As I've said, the, our Nebraska bankers have been working hard to be able to get those applications in, work with their customers, and then also work with the SBA. Uh, as you can imagine, with so many people applying at once, it's been challenging to be able to get those loans into the SBA. But again, working hard, our bankers have submitted 7,837 loans into the Small Business Administration that those loans would total over $1.47 billion for the companies here in our state. And they've got more loans that they're planning on applying with and more dollars they're planning on requesting. Again, this is something that will help those small businesses be able to get through this tough time and keep their people on board. So I want to thank all of our community bankers for working so hard to be able to work with their customers to be able to get them this access to this needed capital to be able to stay open for business and retain their people. That's going to be vitally important to help our Nebraska families. And so with that, I would like to bring up Jeff Kanger from First State Bank to talk a little bit more about this program and what our community bankers are doing. Jeff? Thank you, Governor. Uh, Jeff Kanger with First State Bank Nebraska. Uh, we're a community bank in the southeast part of the state, also a small business with 150 employees. A week ago, Congress passed uh, the CARES Act with key provisions to help families, workers, and small businesses throughout the country. Uh, and they asked banks to help deliver on a lot of the promises in the CARES Act. And over the last week, uh, especially here in Nebraska, our bank and many others have worked through the night over the weekend to process applications to provide uh, the funding to continue to keep people on the payroll through the Paycheck Protection Program, referred to as PPP. And the way we're messaging with our customers uh, and a lot of our peer banks is the Paycheck Protection Program kind of has four quarters to it. The first quarter, get the applications, run them through with SBA, process them, get funding secured for the small businesses that need that money to maintain payroll. That's the best snapshot of where we stand today. We're coming to the end of quarter one. And as the governor mentioned, the state has processed $1.5 billion in these applications. Now quarter two, quarter two is critical. It's the funding component, uh, getting the money out to the small businesses to rehire people and to continue operations. That's coming up here in the, in the next couple of weeks. Quarters three and four are also critical. I'd say quarter three is the documentation side. For all the businesses that are using this program, keep your receipts, track your payroll, because in the fourth quarter, we're gonna need all of that information to ultimately get that loan forgiven. And so that's how we're messaging. That would be the message to small businesses to most effectively utilize this program to bring people back onto the payroll to get our economy fired up again after this event. And just wanna share a couple things for us as a, as a community bank and a community partner. Our chief lending officer, Keith Jansen, was submitting loans at 4 a.m. on Saturday morning. Our operations center, managed by Steph Mensel out of Firth, Nebraska, is working through the night to get an automated process to do as many of these loans as possible. And our SBA experts, Brandon Lesswing and Don Hawk, have looked at initial SBA guidance, revised SBA guidance, and are doing their best to kind of get ahead and anticipate what's coming next. In Nebraska, we play all four quarters, and this is a four-quarter program, uh, but First State Bank Nebraska and all of our colleagues throughout the state are committed to helping. Many banks are still trying to get into the program to provide that much-needed community relief, particularly in our rural areas, and they're working with the Small Business Administration for login. Uh, but we would appreciate you know, everyone's patience and understanding and we are completely committed to seeing this through all four quarters. That's what we do in Nebraska. We play through to the end, and that's what our small businesses are partnering with us to do as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate that. I like the football analogy there. And that kind of goes with what we're talking about with the stay home, stay safe, or uh, stay home, stay healthy, stay connected, which is 
you want to see football this fall, you need to stay home right now. So there you go. I like the, the, the see, I was able to tie that all together. Did you like that, Jeff? You like that, how I pulled that all together? Good. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, we got some other topics we just want to uh, cover. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight is some of the work that people are doing with regard to reaching out to folks whose English is not their first language. So, for example, right now in Grand Island, CHI St. Francis is doing a fantastic job. They're taking out paid advertising on radio and billboards, emphasizing some of the things we've been talking about with social distancing, the signs of having coronavirus, doing that in the Spanish language. I want to thank Dr. Grover at the Grand Island Public Schools because she has been sending out messages to her families. Again, same sort of thing, getting that message out. Um, we talk, I think we talked previously about JBS. They are working uh, with regard to sending home information with their folks, not only in English, but in Spanish and Arabic to be able to help that. I know that News Channel Nebraska and Telemundo are setting up a Grand Island Bureau to help be able to communicate in Spanish and get the message out that way as well. And of course, here at the state of Nebraska, we are also looking for ways to be able to do uh, more with regard to communicating in Spanish. And so you'll be seeing on my social media uh, those postings in Spanish and uh, to be able to help facilitate communication that way as well. So we're looking to be able to expand that communication that way. Uh, we also had a question earlier about tobacco delivery. Paul, I believe this is one of your questions. And we did a little research, and stores can do tobacco delivery and curbside pickup. I think if you go to Hy-Vee, you can go to their grocery cart. I haven't done this myself, but I'm told you can go to the grocery store, click on uh, tobacco, and it'll go to the cart, and that should be delivered. So uh, I don't believe that should be an issue. And uh, I mentioned the pacha soap already. So now we're ready to move on to questions. So uh, for this is from Andrew Osaki, for KETV. Disability rights advocates are calling on me to issue a non-discriminatory statewide guidance order. They say it would be it prevent denying ventilators to anyone with intellectual disability, past history of cancer, immunodiagnosis. Uh, will I sign such an order? What is your opinion of what's going on in other states where this is happening? Well, uh, and then I'll, actually I'm going to go... Uh, what kind of arrangements have been made with local hospitals and medical facilities of the care of sick? Oh, that's a different question, so I'll get to that in a second. Um, so uh, on this, I am not familiar with what is going on in other states with regard to this. Uh, I can tell you here in Nebraska, uh, we don't discriminate against people with developmental disabilities. You know, we take care of people, and I can't imagine anybody in the state would think that was a good idea. And in fact, if you think about all the things we're doing, about social distancing, the 10-person rule, six feet away, uh, staying home when you're sick. All those things are about making sure we protect vulnerable people in our society. Now, I focus a lot on older Nebraskans or people with underlying health conditions, but it applies for everybody. The whole point is to make sure that we slow the spread of the virus and do not overwhelm our health care system, that we have hospital beds and ICU beds available for anybody who needs it. That is something we have talked about from the get-go with regard to what our whole goal for this is. Uh, right now, today, we're probably about 40% capacity uh, of our hospital beds are being used right now. So we still have lots of capacity left in our hospital system, and we're going to continue to focus on making sure we slow the spread so that we don't overwhelm that health care, that hospital system. And I know our, our health care providers and our hospital workers treat people equity, equitably. Uh, the second two questions here get back to corrections. And Andrew, rather than answering your question specifically about corrections, what we're going to do, since we've had a number of questions about corrections, uh, in fact, based on one of our suggestions from in here, we're going to have Scott Frakes come in on Friday to talk more about what the Department of Corrections is doing with regard to uh, responding to the pandemic and how they've got a pandemic plan and what they're doing and so forth. So uh, we'll, we'll pick that up all again on Friday to answer those questions. So Rob McCartney at KETV. Wait a second, KETV guest has two questions again? Oh, jeez, okay. It seems like they're kind of gaming the system here a little bit. Uh, why is Nebraska one of the few states not tracking recovery numbers? Select counties seek to be. Uh, we, uh, we don't have a real good way to, uh, to count those recoveries or to track those recovery numbers right now. And when you know we have the ability to do that later on, we may be able to do that. It's not part of our decision-making process right now. We're really focused on where do we have positive cases being identified and so forth. Uh, but if we have the capability to do that later on, we may uh, do that. But right now, we don't have the facilities to, or the capability to be able to track recoveries. 
Um, and it's not as useful to us as some of the other things we are tracking. Uh, what are the self-quarantine directions for out-of-state travelers? Nebraska's website only references a few regions. Will information provide, uh, provided on March 30 and 31st be formalized into guidance from the state? Uh, so I think what Rob's referring to is saying, hey, anybody who's traveling outside of the state of Nebraska and coming back to Nebraska, so if you're one of those snowbirds, maybe from Arizona or Florida, when you come back, you need to quarantine for 14 days. If you're from out of state and you've got a cabin here in Nebraska and you're coming to Nebraska, you need to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, if you've traveled anywhere within this country and you're coming back, quarantine for 14 days. Uh, what Rob is pointing out is our website does not reflect that specifically. We are working to uh, get that all updated, but again, please follow that direction. If you've been traveling out of state and you come back, quarantine for 14 days. Okay. Okay, and do I have any update on the situation at YRTC Kearney? Sunday's news release said the test results were expected midweek. Uh, that's from Grant Schulte, the Associated Press. So we uh, used the National Guard on Sunday to start doing testing at YRTC. My understanding is, Dr. Antonio, I talked to you earlier today, we didn't have those results back, or do we? Oh, no, that was Grand Island. Do we have results from YRTC? We do. You want to come up and talk about those for a little bit? Sure. Come on up, please. Yes, uh, National Guard set up testing site in, at the YRTC in Kearney on Sunday and some on Monday. On Sunday, over 162 tests were done. On Monday, close to 100 tests were done. And so far, there's only been two staff members that have tested positive. So, so far, no residents of the YRTC have tested positive. So those are, it's good news for everybody. Again, all the contact investigations were done appropriately. So we should be getting, uh, Grand Island was set up for testing yesterday and today again, testing is being done and we should have those results by tomorrow. Is that two additional or is that just confirmed? Two total. Two total. Two total. No, 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 we're right. Thank you, Dr. Antone. Uh, Marion Bailey from WWT, once social distancing is lifted, will things go back to normal all at once or will the governor suggest releasing it in phases? So uh, example, we will go to groups of 20, uh, the question is, will we go to groups of 25, then 50, then maybe 250 and um, so forth? Will it, uh, other businesses be added back in, as a, in phases? So uh, Marion, actually you've got it exactly right. As we get to the end of April and we're reevaluating uh, where we are with regard to the numbers and the social distancing and so forth. And at whatever point we decide we're going to start relaxing those restrictions, they will just be relaxed. They will not all be taken off at once. So we will do it in stages because what we want to do is make sure that we don't see a bounce back by the virus. So as we start lifting those restrictions, we want to, we're going to keep a lid on those new infection rates so that we don't see uh, spikes in the outbreak of the virus. So that's really going to be our goal is to, to keep a lid on how fast that virus is spreading here on our state once we start lifting those restrictions. Okay, Taylor, did we get any more in? Yes, Sterling Young wants to know, has the state had consultations with Gage County and the retirement center there about their COVID cases, and should Gage County have been under a state-directed health measure earlier? So with regard to Gage County and the... Um, long-term care facility down there that had the number of cases of people testing positive. Uh, the state has reached out to them. They're doing the contact investigation like they would always do. Actually, I think it would be the local public health departments doing that contact investigation to trace how that all got done and quarantine people appropriately. I think you said we've actually moved some of the more acute care people from that facility. Is that accurate, Dr. Antone? And uh, then with regard to the, the second part of the question, uh, Joanne said, should that have been done sooner? Again, we were very clear over a month ago, well, no, about a month ago, uh, how we were doing, working on all this with regard to being able to, um, you know, roll out those directed health measures across the state as we saw this. And so, uh, you know, our plan was pretty clear from the get-go. But even before we issued the directive health measure for that included Gage County, I had been in contact, for example, with Stan Worth, the mayor of Beatrice, because Gage County was still covered under the 10-person rule from March 16th. And so when he had some issues with some businesses, he and I were on the phone talking about how to handle it. So uh, this was something where, you know, we'd had engagement, uh, you know, down in Gage County 
uh, prior to this, and it really was being treated the way every place else in the state was being treated with regard to, hey, you're supposed to be uh, enforcing the 10-person rule. And remember that, that when we put the DHM, while it did things like make sure the schools were operating without children until May 31st, that was already happening. We talked about restaurants not having dine-in or bars not having dine-in. It was all carry-out, but remember, they were limited to 10 people already beforehand. So in many ways, the DHM uh, was uh, and prohibited elective surgeries, but the 10-person rule was already, in fact, everywhere uh, in place everywhere in our state going back to March 16th. We have two questions from KPTM. The first one is, the reason the grass is not tracking or releasing the number of people who have recovered from COVID. Okay, I, uh, with regard to KPTM, I just answered the question for Rob McCartney about why we're not tracking recoveries. We just don't have the facility to be able to do that right now, and it's not as useful as some of the other data we're tracking. Um, the president said today that Republicans should fight against So uh, KPTM is also saying, apparently the president said, and I have not seen this, so I'm taking their word for it, that, that uh, states should fight against mail-in voting programs. Uh, we have and been promoting our early ballot request program that has been mailed out to everybody in the state, and we're encouraging people. This is a great way to be able to vote in the May 12th primary. The May 12th primary is not being moved. It's happening May 12th. But your early ballot voting request form is due May 1st, so that's a little green card got it in the mail, fill it out, send it back, you'll get your ballot in the mail, you can then mail it back in or you can drop it off one of your county boxes and we are encouraging people to take advantage of that to be able to do it. Polling stations will be open, but uh, the early ballot request form is a great way to be able to participate in the uh, May 12th primary and to be able to vote. Martha Sauter has two questions. The first one is Senator Sinner said today that economic damage caused by the coronavirus has wiped out chances of property tax relief because state revenues will drop. You so Martha Stoddard is asking that uh, uh, Appropriations Chair John Stinner in the legislature has said that the coronavirus and the impact on the economy and state revenues has wiped out the chance for property taxes. Uh, I believe that is way too premature to be able to say that right now. Certainly we expect impacts on the revenues, um, but how that is going to play out, I think we just don't know at this point with regard to how that's going to impact our state revenues or the uh, property tax bill and so forth. So it's, it's too early to tell at this point. State employees are being required to work in offices with many, more than 10 people. What provisions have been made to protect them and their coworkers? So uh, Martha also asked, uh, our state teammates are being asked to work in buildings with more than 10 people and what precautions are in place to be able to uh, keep them safe. So again, first of all, let's just take a step back. Uh, you can have a big office building and I know there's anecdotal evidence of this of people going to work in those buildings, there's hardly anybody there. Uh, and that's in part, large part, because our companies, including the state, has encouraged people to work from home. So we at the state, we're trying to get people to telework, uh, all that sort of stuff with regard to making sure that we can uh, really spread people out in our buildings. We're working to spread people out. Uh, we're also doing additional sanitation and janitorial services to be able to help keep uh, things clean. And uh, we can follow up Martha with a more exhaustive list of all the things that we're doing to help you know, protect the, the health and safety of our teammates. But we certainly are doing that here in the state of Nebraska. We understand that there's going to be many businesses who have more than 10 people. Again, the key, folks, is having 10 people in a social gathering in a group. You can have 10 people in a big building. If you space them all out, they're going to be just fine. William Patmore has two questions. Uh, will efforts be made to reach the Yazidi population or people who speak Arabic? So uh, William Padmore asks, are there efforts being made to reach the Yazidi population or people who speak Arabic? And certainly I would encourage, this is a great opportunity to stay connected. So if you know of people in your community that English is not their first language and you speak, say, Arabic, that's a great opportunity to be able to work with those folks to be able to help make sure that they're getting the things they need, whether it's groceries, uh, they're staying home, they understand all the social distancing guidelines, all of that. Great opportunity for people to get engaged with their congregations. I know companies, again, I mentioned JBS earlier, they're doing communications in Arabic. Uh, so I th there's a number of folks out there that are doing it. Uh, I think in our public schools, there's 130 different languages being spoken. So uh, I know that, uh, again, schools are taking a look at that because I've talked to Matt uh, Bloomstead, our Commissioner for Education, about the challenges they've got as well. So uh, obviously there's always going to be opportunities for us to improve, uh, but I think there's a lot of folks who are actually taking this upon themselves to be able to help educate folks. William Patmore would also like to know, will there be an effort to reach out to the black population about the dangers of the virus in light of the fact uh, 
Um, there's national reports about African American people being disproportionately affected. So. Uh, uh, Mr. Padmore is also asking about what about you're doing about the African American community, and uh, we're also reaching out there. I, a couple of Saturdays ago, I was on a uh, African American radio station with Preston Love talking about the need to social distancing. Cheryl Logan was on that show as well. So there are efforts to be able to reach out to all the different communities to be able to make sure that everybody is getting the message with regard to how important it is to slow the spread of coronavirus to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. And then last question here. Andrew Zaki wants to know if there's been any uh, efforts made to reach out to the Native American tribes and what, how they may have been helped. So the question is about uh, Andrew Zaki is asking about the Native American tribes. And again, same deal. We actually have set up uh, biweekly phone calls with uh, the chairman of all the tribes here in Nebraska, uh, Judy Goshkabash, uh, who's our executive director for the Native American Commission, is uh, working on that with us as well. And we have assigned somebody in HHS to work directly with them with regard to, for example, their needs for PPE and so forth. So, so the answer is yes. Other questions? We're, oh, yeah. Jeff. Sure. So the question is what uh, responsibility has been put on small banks uh, through the CARES Act to deliver on a lot of the small business loan programs. Uh, I would call it a responsibility and a duty. Uh, so we're largely a funding mechanism for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, so that's not grant money that comes from the federal government. That's, that's a bank's liquidity and funding. So we're taking care of that piece to expedite the resources to small businesses as much as possible. Um, but I would share from the employee standpoint, I, I mentioned the all hours of work, night, weekends, through the clock. Um, the motivation, the desire to do that is to take care of neighbor, take care of church, take care of Main Street small businesses. And that's another key thing to highlight from the Paycheck Protection Program. Nonprofits and churches are also uh, eligible. SBA came out with more guidance on that earlier in the week. So when you see folks across Nebraska's community banks, staying late, coming in early, and going through the weekend. They're doing it for their neighbors. Um, and so, yes, there is a responsibility there through the CARES Act. There's a huge investment from First State Bank, Nebraska, and others, but also a duty, because uh, we're all in this together. So how does it work? You lend money to a local business, they provide the documentation, and then you forgive the loan, and the government ultimately reimburses you? That's the plan we're going with Why right now. I'm sorry. So I'm, thank you. Uh, sure. So it sounds like what's, what's the process from uh, application to funding to then borrower asking uh, for loan forgiveness? And as you mentioned, that's correct. So someone would come in and apply for a loan. We'll process it through the SBA, get the funds set aside. And where we stand today is we're waiting for guidance to close on those loans. Um, are there special forms, things like that? And getting that closing packet correct is critical because that's what will be relied upon for the forgiveness part down the line. And so then the borrower will come back after a period of weeks, provide documentation uh, that the money went to eligible expenses, primarily payroll. The lender will then go through that packet, forgive the debt, and then apply to SBA for that portion to be purchased back. I want to say that's very fluid at this point in time. SBA is taking a step-by-step -step approach. Um, so we're primarily focused on the processing and funding piece and look for more information from them on, on the forgiveness down the line. So I guess the question is, um, if there are funds that are not reimbursed uh, by the SBA, uh, there are provisions through the CARES Act on what the debt would then look like. Um, so we're aware that that's a possibility, and that's where having patience from the borrower right now is really critical to get a lot of those questions answered. As banks continue to try and come on board to process these loans, um, that's, that's a key component of risk as well that we anticipate and look forward to a little more guidance and clarity. And just to give you know, a, a fair shake to the Small Business Administration, this thing was passed just over a week ago. Um, we're moving very quickly. 
they are also working very, very hard to provide additional guidance. But this funding piece is really important, and I know people are excited to get back to work. Small business owners are excited to rehire, um, but there are some steps here in place that your community banks are largely relying on, on SBA to give guidance on, on how to get it right, uh, because the expectation is on the backside of a forgivable loan and, and economic redevelopment. Sure, I think the question is what's the expectation within the Paycheck Protection Program of the CARES Act? And I would really defer that to Congress in, in their intent. I, I can't jump into that, but I, I appreciate the question. Excuse me. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Well, we'll certainly take a look at that issue, Fred, but again, it's not in our laws that we do that, and, and I don't think that people, I don't think healthcare providers would be doing that anyway. So, and the whole point of our program, and again, our whole point of our program is to make sure there are hospital beds, ICU units for everybody who shows up. That's the whole point, and that's why I stress that we're only at about 40% capacity of hospital beds right now. Paul. So the question was, uh, there's a model out there, the IHME, I believe is the one you're referring to, Paul? The yeah. University of Washington, yeah. Uh, shows, uh, actually did an update overnight and shows that uh, we actually will need fewer resources here in the state, including ventilators. And would we be considering then sending those ventilators uh, to another state? Uh, well, that, that's a model. And uh, as Dr. Ali Khan would tell you, models aren't necessarily all that good at being predictive. It's a, it's a way to help think about the program. And I think as we look here in Nebraska, over the course of the next few weeks, we're gonna be hitting our peak here in Nebraska. So we wanna see how this is all, st we're still all very you know, early in this as well. So we wanna see how this develops. I think it's also important to know that uh, the state has ordered or looked to buy more ventilators, but in general, those ventilators are owned by private healthcare firms, right? They're owned by hospitals. They're not, they're not owned by the state. The, the vast majority of those are owned by somebody else. So we just don't have the ability to just go in and take somebody's ventilators and, and ship them off to somebody else. So, but, you know, so we're going to keep evaluating this as we see where we are with regard to our ec epidemic, epidemic curve and what other states' needs are. Uh, but right now, I think we have to remain focused on what we're doing here in Nebraska. Sure. So the, the, what the question Paul is asking is that as we get through this and we maybe start looking at relaxing some of the restrictions, what would we might relax? Well, so for example, right now we're at a 10-person rule. No gatherings larger than 10-person. So maybe as we start relaxing this, we might relax that to something like 20 people or 25 people and gradually take that number up over time as we saw that we could take that number up and we didn't see that the number of cases were spiking because of that. So it would be something along those sort of lines. Reopening uh, sit-down restaurants and bars may be a part of that as well, too. You know, we'll, as we get into this toward the end of the month, we'll be reevaluating where we are with regard to where the virus is, and we'll be making those decisions. So uh, an economist apparently said areas of Iowa, Nebraska, and Wisconsin may open first, and certainly we hope that's the case. But again, we're going to manage this uh, according to the plan that we created over a month ago with regard to how we're going to manage this for our state, a Nebraska plan. And the Nebraska plan is the one we've rolled out, and when it comes to relaxing those restrictions, it'll be a Nebraska plan as well. It'll be about 
what are we relaxing, and then seeing if it causes a spike in cases in our state to make sure that we can keep control of this so that we don't overwhelm the healthcare facilities. And again, that's the whole goal is to make sure uh, everybody who goes to the hospital will be able to get the care they need so we don't overwhelm that system, whether it's hospital beds, ICU beds, ventilators, it'll all be about making sure that we don't overwhelm that healthcare system. So as we relax things, that's what we're gonna be looking at. Vascular. Vascular, thank you. Uh, and, and diabetes. How should Nebraskans think about the relative danger posed by this? Don't so just to question. sort of repeat the question is the number of deaths actually went down about half today according to that IHME model from about 480, I think, down to 280 today or 289, uh, which is great. I mean... I hope that's the case, but as Governor said, models are only supposed to be how you think about things ahead of time. And that's lower than the deaths that'll be from some of the other diseases that uh, you mentioned, as far as cerebral vascular disease, diabetes, things like that. And uh, you're wondering, you know, how should we think of COVID then as being really a problem, I guess, is what you're saying. Or should we even think that it's a problem? Number one, I'd answer that by saying, We've, the local public health departments, the governor's leadership, everybody's leadership at DHHS, I hope has kept it that way. And that's why we're in that situation to begin with. That's why maybe the model even went down from yesterday to today. And that's without even making any of the adjustments that the governor's already implemented in this state. But we have to take it seriously. I mean, it's, it's, it's a serious disease. Once it strikes, especially in elderly or patients with comorbidities, it's, it's sort of like the tipping point for them to, to actually cause a death or a fatality. And we don't want that to happen. We want to keep those people alive if we can. So I think it's, it's I mean, it's good that you asked that question, but I, I think we still are taking it very seriously at this point. I'll, I'll go first and I'll let the governor go, but um, my thought about that is that once, once we get a certain prevalence rate in the public and they become immune, basically, by catching the disease, you become immune, and then it's sort of like doing a vaccine. You have maybe 40%, 50% of the population vaccinated. And so we'll, we'll keep doing what we're doing. I mean, we're still gonna practice good hygiene, cover your cough, things of that nature try to keep that second surge from coming. Did you want to add anything? Sure. So I think this also gets back to um, the question is about, again, what happens if some experts are predicting a second rebound in the fall? This gets back to how we manage the restrictions and how we loosen them up steadily over time rather than taking them off all at once so that we can make sure we manage the level of virus in our state so we don't see the kind of bounce back that some experts are predicting. So obviously one of the things that we're gonna to have to manage when we get there is uh, what are we doing about schools coming back in session? And that's something we'll work uh, closely with um, the Commissioner of Education, Matt Bloomstead, and our superintendents across the state to be able to manage and figure out the best way to do it. Is there a question for Jeff? On Jeff. So the question was, have any businesses received funding on loans from the CARES Act yet? Um, there are a few different loan programs. I can speak to the Paycheck Protection Program that we're participating in. Um, I'm not aware of, of any Nebraska banks that have funded loans at this point in time. Okay. Other questions? Or is this kind of a one-time thing? 
so the question was with regard to the big box stores and some of the changes they're making and just kind of seeing how that was all working out. Uh, I had informally sent uh, some uh, State Patrol folks there. It was really kind of an informal check. Uh, I know the mayor was doing, uh, Mayor of Omaha was also doing kind of her sort of informal checks just to see how things were going. People were taking pictures and sending, her, sending them to her and she was sending them to me as well. So it really was kind of an informal thing. It's not something we're intending to be, uh, you know, like an ongoing formal program. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so we uh, sent the National Guard to go to Grand Island. They started testing yesterday. They did 75 tests. They're doing 75 today. We're going to do another day of testing tomorrow with CHI, providing the test results on those. Uh, again, we don't have the results of those back yet, so I can't share those because that will still take time to process through the laboratory. But that's our plan for the today, tomorrow, uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow is those three days of testing. Can you say why Grand Island was such a hot spot? So... You know, the question was, why do we think Grand Island became such a hot spot? I don't, we don't have any hard data to be able to share. I know there was a large party that occurred March 14th that one of the people, and Dr. Anton, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe one of the people who died in Grand Island was actually at that party. And that could have been uh, an opportunity for the virus to be spread quickly in the community. You know, again, this is why we limit, again, this is a great reason, folks, why we limit those social interactions to 10 people or less. Right? If there had only been 10 people at that party, there would have been a lot less opportunity to spread the virus than if there were, say, 400 people. Now, I'm not saying that was actually the case because we don't know. We just don't know. We know somebody who had the virus was there. Uh, we know that person died. But we, we don't know how, why the virus would have spread there versus something else. Um, so it's, it's tough to say. We also know that we've got a lot of manufacturing facilities in Grand Island, too. And while a lot of people can work from home, a lot of our state teammates are working from home, uh, office personnel can work from home. Manufacturing is just typically not the type of industry that you can work from home very easily. So, you know, that presents other issues, especially if you had the virus in your community before, you know, you really knew about it that could have been a contributor there. So there's a, a variety of things. We just don't know for sure. We do the case contact management to make sure that the people who do have it, we get isolated and quarantined. I don't know, Dr. Antone, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? <clears throat> You don't have to. I'm not making you. No, I think I can answer that. First part of the question, yes, we, we uh, got the cooperation. The initial two days of testing, the tests were done through the Nebraska Public Health Lab, and then we had the cooperation of, for CHI. They have their own capability of testing, too, and that's how we were able to increase it to the third day and increase the number of tests. Do you have the number that you have I don't have that number today. Uh, thank you for asking that question. The question was, if um, you're going to be immune once you get the disease, then why not just wait and get it, and then you know you're going to be immune, and then, you know, it's no big deal, especially for the younger population, who really doesn't affect that much as far as fatalities go or even illness goes. But uh, the way I look at it is that it's only going to be good for a certain period of time. This virus is going to mutate again with time, and we're going to need to get vaccinated again next year. For this virus but by then hopefully we'll have that vaccine so it's good for the short term not for the long term great folks thanks again for coming to get our update with regard to how the state is fighting the spread of coronavirus here in our state again i want to end by reinforcing how important it is through the rest of the month of april that we redouble our efforts to slow the spread of virus here in our state by following all the social practicing guidelines like the 10 person rule six foot distance rule, stay home when you're sick, all washing your hands often, all that sort of thing will help us slow the spread of the virus here in our state. Everybody, every Nebraskan needs to take a personal responsibility to be a part of this fight against the coronavirus. Whether we're talking about younger people or people who are my age, everybody can be a part of this by practicing those good social distancing guidelines to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Thank you very much, folks. We'll see you back here tomorrow.